Hello everyone and welcome to the November 2nd Classroom 2.0 live show. My name is Lori Moffitt. I'm one of the co-hosts along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. I want to thank Tammy for closed captioning the show for us. And today we're, we're going to have Sam Patterson with EduPuppets, uh, EduPuppets in K-12. Sam Patterson is our special guest today. We do have a live binder for today, and the link here is at the bottom of the slide. The live link is in the chat. Uh, the live binders now have related tabs along the left edge of the binder. So there's the live binder for today. We always have the recordings posted in the archive and resources section of the Classroom 2.0 website. So Peggy's also put in the chat the link for the archives and resources page. We'd like to find out where in the world you're logging in from. So if you would please use the second whiteboard tool from the top and mark where you are in the world. Um, we always like to see where the audience is coming from. I'm from central Pennsylvania. Uh, Tammy's from southwest Arkansas. Peggy's from Phoenix. So it looks like today we've got mostly United States folks right now. No, we've got somebody from Argentina. Oh, yes. All right, we'll start with the polling questions, and this is a yes-no question. Uh, you can't vote with the yes-no replies on the slide. You'll need to use the polling or type in the chat. First question is, do you use puppets in your classroom? So yes is the green check, no is the red X. Go ahead and vote, and I'll post these to the whiteboard. So let me publish those. We do have two of our participants that do use puppets. Most do not, and most didn't vote on the question. The next polling question, have, have you ever taught using a puppet? Again, yes is the green check, no is the red X. And I'll post these to the whiteboard. But a little closer numbers, we've got a little bit more than a third that have not and a little bit more than a quarter that have. And the poll question three, do you allow students to use puppets? Green check for yes, red X for no. And again, I'll post these to the whiteboard. And almost half do. I'd like to introduce Sam Patterson of EduPuppets. Sam has been teaching for 12 years and has taught grades K-12 to in math, English, uh, photography, and technology. Um, Sam is um, a K-5 to tech integration specialist at Gideon Hosner Jewish Day School in Palo Alto. Uh, he's founder of the Palo Alto Technology Using Educators. Um, 
Sam has authored a couple of blogs, Technology and Education and Pedagogy Amongst Technology. He's presented at ISTE 13. He's founded Hashtag Patui. Um, and he's the man behind Waka and the Edu Puppets. So the newbie question for you, Sam, is why would puppets be useful as part of your teaching toolbox? I think that's a great question, and it's certainly one that I came across a lot when I started using puppets <coughs> as a high school teacher, and mostly I got that question from my other teachers. Um, but it, it turns out that they're incredibly versatile, and one of the things that I notice with puppets is they're kind of a... Um, an end run around ego issues, whether it's myself, my own, or my students, there's things you can do and express through puppets that is significantly easier than trying to do it, you know, through yourself. Um, whether it's figuring something out, admitting a mistake, you know, working through a difficult problem, all of these can be made easier uh, with puppets. And as a teacher, there's something that is incredibly engaging about a puppet. And, you know, it's kind of like a, in the chat, I think it was uh, Katie, no, I can't remember who it was, but it said they had a puppet in their bag of tricks as a substitute. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing. It's like a secret weapon. Boom, you have their attention. So that's, you know, one of the things that I really see is, useful for why that should be part of your teaching toolbox or versatility and ultimately their the the level of engagement you can reach with it um, what I've found is that as I teach I really want to be doing high engagement teaching I believe in high engagement pedagogy and for me that has meant exploring all of the different ways that my classroom can be organized and run and how choice can fit and last year in the middle of my tech integration journey i kind of stumbled into puppets and one i was making a video and i said wow what i really need in this video is a puppet and a lot of this has to do with the fact that i grew up on you know a regular diet of sesame street and electric company and well-designed, engaging, puppet-based educational programming. And with today's technology, I can, you know, I can do all of that just inside of one laptop. I mean, even with green screen and everything. But I was limited because most of the time that I was working to learn video, I had only my own face to work with. So I realized I needed to either find people that would be willing to hang out with me and make videos all the time, or uh, come up with a puppet I could use. When I started looking at puppets, I was, there's an issue I have with copyright where I want everything I create as a teacher to be completely copyright happy. And I wasn't really sure if I make a lesson using, for example, a Jim Henson Muppet that I had bought at the store. Is that a copyright infringement if I'm using that in a lesson that later I want to be able to market or be able to share with a wide audience? Um, are they ever going to come in and say, YouTube, take that down because we don't want Ernie teaching calculus or whatever it is. I don't know calculus. It's just a random example. Um, so I said, I wonder if I can make puppets. Now, a little bit of history. Like I said, I was kind of really brought up on a good diet of puppets coming through my television and they were quality entertaining intelligent puppets and the uh when i was in high school i did learn to sew and i had actually made a few maybe i'll grab one later uh felt hand puppets when i was 13 or 14 and that was a fun experience but soon it was time to you know get serious and go off to college and get a career and Etc. And I found myself after having gotten my career and my degree and everything back at, I wonder if I can make puppets. And I, po I searched on YouTube and I found that it really was uh, not difficult 
to make puppets. In fact, this puppet uh, right here on the right is Dewey, and he was the first puppet I made. He's a foam head construction, so there's uh, it's actually, I think, half inch or one inch foam. It's much too thick. I use the thinner foam now in his head, and he's covered with orange fleece, and his hair is made out of yellow feathers, but he's the first puppet that I made. Um, and then I set about making videos and trying to figure out, but after I made one puppet, I said, well, I really want to make others. Um, and I immediately tried to figure out how can I apply this in my classroom because that's kind of my MO in teaching. I find something I'm excited about and I say, okay, what good can this do in education specifically in my classroom? And what I came upon was at the time I was teaching ninth grade English. And if you want a group of students that think they're too cool for puppets, high school is a pretty good place to start. So it's a little bit of a hard sell, but once it takes, it's amazing. And this is Cassius from a project that we were calling Project Caesar, in which they designed puppets to act out Julius Caesar. Um, it was a project-based learning experiment where they were actually writing a Kickstarter to create a feature-length puppet movie of Julius Caesar. Um, it was one of those project-based learnings that only got so far, but we did make puppets in the classroom, and this puppet was made primarily by students. Um, there's others in this set. Now, he is a fabric puppet with polyester fill in his head. He's just kind of two halves sewn together. You can see the seam right there. Um, and they actually put his mouth in upside down, which gives him this kind of, you know, underbite or overbite on the bottom. It's underbite, I don't know. And once that happened, the kids said, oh, what do we do? And I said, well, we'll make him the bad guy. And we gave him these overbearing eyebrows and this really bad haircut. And he became Cassius in Julius Caesar. Um, this is, uh, you can't completely see him, eyeballs drive engagement. So the reason that I was making puppets was because I wanted somebody else's face in the videos I was creating for class. Uh, often these videos would be made before I got a chance to go to the gym in the morning because that was the only time the building was quiet enough and I didn't have students coming in and interrupting me. Um, you know, it's not really interrupting me, right? Interacting with them is what I'm doing, but when you're trying to record something, so the solution is don't try to record during school hours, which gets tricky. Um, but I wanted to use puppets because they do have eyeballs and they do focus and you do track them and you can make a puppet incredibly engaging and that's what I was looking for kind of a personal connection so my students meet my puppets in person and then sometimes they end up in a video asking them to do stuff um, one of the side effects of bringing these puppets from high school to a k-5 setting where I'm the technology guy is that it's everybody knows my puppets right I they're I, the first time I went into all of the classes, K through 4, instead of bringing the iPad card, I brought the puppets, and they had a conversation with the puppets about technology, and they interviewed the puppets. So the kids have this great relationship with my puppets already. So it's interesting. It's like almost cloning myself as a teacher and being able to kind of multiply engagement that way. One of the other fun things that... I've found with doing puppets and kind of doing them publicly and being, you know, out there and saying, hey, this is the thing I'm doing in my classroom and I want to talk to people about it, um, is that the Waka and the Edu puppets have gotten to go to a lot of different conferences. They've gotten to meet some great people. And although it's been a little challenging to walk up to someone like George Koros and say, hi, you don't know me, but I'd like to interview you with my puppet. Um, once you do that, it's it's a lot of fun. And um, here, this is a slide that I... So not only has Waka gotten to meet George Koros, now not everybody is really excited about Waka. Alicia Fox of WWE fame, yeah, she's a lady wrestler. <laughs> she was so excited to meet Waka, she just wanted to snuggle with him. Whereas Alfie Cohen... 
while an amazing educator and speaker was very nervous about the puppet posing with him. Um, somebody on Twitter actually made this. I guess one of the Cardinals players was named Waka, and they had a little cognitive dissonance that they showed me for there. And Waka even got to participate in the ISTE 13 conference as one of the judges in the Iron Chef competition. Um, once you set a group of kids to building puppets, you end up with a good number of puppets. And most of the puppets after the project went home with the kids. But some got to stay with me, and one of them was I Puppet Sammy. I'm just kind of running through the puppet family here at the beginning so you can get a sense of the, the range that we're dealing with. And I Puppet Sammy is a tribute to uh, John Samuelson, or iPad Sammy, because he wears blue a lot. And sometimes we pick on him on the podcast. And the puppets show up on the podcast a lot, and then I realized that this guy's hair is kind of unique, and sometimes John covers his hair because it's kind of unique. Well, I, I've said enough, but it's kind of fun to create puppets in someone's image, kind of an homage to them. Um, but what I really want to talk about is puppets in class. When you take... When you, when you carry an armful of puppets down the hallway of a high school, there's a lot of questions you get. And my favorite one was, when are we going to make puppets? I had, this was actually asked of me before I brought the puppets into class at all. One of my freshmen who had been watching what I'd been doing with creating puppets and having them make videos and whatnot, said, you know, when are we going to make puppets? Because he'd seen how I work. He knows that what I do, they do, as soon as I figure out enough of it that they can figure out more of it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about teaching with the puppet on your hands. Now, this is something that I did not do as much in high school. Honestly, they, at the different grade levels, I think there are completely different activities that are appropriate to do with the kids and the puppets. Um, the, I, I, I totally am enthusiastic about kids puppeting at all grade levels, but what I really want to stress is that if you are making these puppets by hand, have the kids make the puppets they're going to use. It's their handmade puppets are not of toy quality. Toy quality is actually superior to handmade puppets, even though the handmade puppets can look neater at times. The toys are much more durable. Um, but anyway, so I really only started teaching with the puppet on my hand this summer with some middle schoolers. I did it once or twice. This year with the kindergarten through fourth graders, I'm doing it almost every time that I see them. And oftentimes it is, the, the role is really just a transition one. The first time that I went into school or went into class with the puppets, we had a long conversation and I introduced the puppets. And I talked a lot about how technology helped me find my puppet making skill and how the, I, I talked to other people online. I really kind of used it as a, mod, a digital citizenship model almost and kind of a uh, you know, exploring the Internet model, really talked about how these really were related to my technology journey. And then they created questions to ask the puppets and interviewed the puppets and just interacted with the puppets, which largely turned into improv on my part and exploration on their part. Um, and that was good. That was a nice long form piece, but I'm not going to do that very often. Now when I go into the first grade class, they're just finishing up one class or another, and they've all been doing something else, and I want to transition them to learning about an app on the iPad, exploring something else with technology, focusing on the computer lab. The puppet comes out, and then they have a short conversation, and a lot of times the puppet will, why don't you use by date? Sorry. A lot of times Walker will say, Walker, well, for the, the first graders, I know they're, they're learning about coral reefs right now, and they have a lot of interesting stuff hung on the walls. So I'll usually look around, and I'll ask a question, and then two or three of them will answer it, then I'll ask another question, and then everyone will answer it. So it's a way of just kind of re-engaging them in their environment, but at the same time, they, they seem to focus more quickly on me, and I think it's because I'm bright orange. I think that's very well said, Walker. Thank you. 
um, the voice. Now, it may seem a little silly to think about, but in reality, as teachers, our voice is a pretty precious commodity. Uh, we have to preserve it because without it, we're sunk. And it's our main mode of communication with the kids. It needs to carry the, the range of expression that we use on any given day, which, as you know, is incredibly wide. Um, and it's got to also work with puppets. So I have several different voices. And initially, like Dewey, my first puppet, we can go back to him and I can come back here. Uh, Dewey. Hello. Has a, a really kind of charming affect, and he's about four, and he's very curious. And oh, I'm full of wonder. Yes, you're you're full of wonder, Dewey. Hello, is everybody here? Yes, yes, Dewey. Everybody's here. What are we doing? Um, I'm just kind of talking to them about puppets and how they're made and what they do in class. I don't get to go to class very often. No, you just go and see the kindergartners. Do you know why? Because I'm four. Right. Now, I need to get back to the people in the room, okay? Okay. Um, and Dewey is a phenomenal personality. I love him. I wouldn't change him for the world. I can't do that voice for long. I cannot do that for a whole classroom, and I cannot uh, really command the attention of a class if I need to with that voice. Quiet voices are incredibly useful, but I can't use that one every day. Um, and when you're thinking about the voice, I know that several teachers have puppets who mainly just whisper in their ear, so there isn't a voice for the puppet. And the kids have to ask what the puppet said. Um, and that's a real great way of engagement. Uh, some puppets have very quiet voices, and that's a great strategy because if the students are really tuned into the puppet and they want to know what the puppet's saying, they have to actually get quiet enough to hear it. Um, and they understand that they're missing out when they're talking over the puppet. Um, and that kind of connects to one of my favorite threads recently, which is the whole fear of missing, you know, how teachers need to create the fear of missing out. It's about engagement. Now, Waka's voice is one where I basically tried to come up with a voice that was very similar to, nearly as comfortable at, and as comfortable as my regular speaking voice, but it was markedly different. And so it is just basically a very nasal version of my voice that is pretty easy to do and pretty easy to remember. One of the, uh, he's right, this is, this is Walker, right? And, uh, the first time the fifth graders saw a video with Waka, and they were like, did, did you have a cold when you made that video? And I thought, that's, that's really funny. No, that's my voice. Puppets don't get colds. We're always kind of full of fluff, though. Um, so that voice I can do for extended amounts of time. You know, basically, it became limited by the podcast we were doing, which would go for an hour. And while I don't speak the whole hour, I have to be able to jump in and out of that voice pretty quickly. And that's a voice that's incredibly comfortable to me. Um, there's some shorter voices that are, you know, for one particular effect, and you can do anything you want with them. But if you're coming up with kind of a main persona voice, then you want to make sure that that's one that you can sustain. Now, when I talk about special purpose voices here, I'll switch on the camera real quick and introduce you to one Hello, I'm Batman. Uh, uh, really, actually, your name's Bateman? The E is silent. So, like, you know, that voice can't do a whole lot, but if you've seen the videos online of Bat Dad, that was pretty inspirational. And I came across that little mask, and I had several of those red puppets around because... The red guys were the 20 some conspirators in Julius Caesar. Um, and teaching with the puppet on your hand in video is something that I'm, as I said, I got into puppeting mainly because of video. I was making videos and I needed other faces in them. 
So what I've been working towards and actually just recently managed to achieve, whoa, is um, this setup where I'm using the, trying to figure out how to launch this screenshot thing. There we go. I'm using the uh, puppet on screen. There we go. There we go. Um, so when I'm talking about, and there's a link to this in the live binder, this is Walk Introduces Days of the Dinosaur. So the other day what I did was I re pre-recorded this video, and then when I went into first, uh, second grade to talk to them about Days of the Dinosaur, they watched this video. And what I've got here on the screen, this is a screen capture. I was using the front row screen capture software, but you can reuse Snagit or Screencast-O-Matic, anything that does screen capture. And I just layered a few windows on here. I layered my reflector app window here so I could show them Daisy the Dinosaur, which is what I really wanted to do. I layered a preview window for my webcam here, which was focusing on Waka. Um, I dropped this Internet Explorer window here because the bottom half of the webcam window was showing my shoulder and arm, and I needed to mask that out somehow. So this could be anything. And I think in an ideal situation, I'd find something more pedagogically relevant to put here. But instead, I just put my blog there because at least I knew that would cover this up and I knew everything that's on this page is appropriate and it has my face. Um, eyeballs drive engagement. I've got two sets on this one and this one moves. So that's pretty good. And as far as engagement, this video, I showed this video to two different groups of second graders yesterday. The first group, and when Waka asks a question, he pauses to take an answer. And I don't remember actually particularly saying, oh, I have to make sure I pause. I think I just did that because that was my experience with Sesame Street. Um, but the first group of second graders didn't vocally interact with the screen. The second group of second graders did. And as soon as one did, they all did. It was like they were all just waiting to do it until one person did it and they knew it was okay. So then they were all just talking with the screen. Um, and that was really interesting to me. And I'll have to see what happens with that more. Now, what can be really awesome is when you use puppets to empower students. Um, I like how they can help me engage students, help me direct their attention, make transitions more um, smooth. And honestly, if you told me at the beginning of my teaching career that using puppets in class was going to help me with what I was looking at then as classroom management issues, that I would have been very surprised. I, there's no way. But it's all just part of the relationship. For me, I think it really, really works because I love interacting that way. I have a great time doing it. And I think engaging your students, knowing your students, forming a relationship with your students, and having a lot of fun while you're working with them is an awesome combination. For me, that happens to also include puppets. Now, once, this is Pi Pi, by the way, um, she is a foam head puppet similar to Dewey. I made her before um, Waka, and she was actually kind of an experiment to see how much detail I could get into a foam head puppet and how realistic I could make it look. I'm pretty happy with her. She's, uh, she's one I never let anyone else touch. I'm a little proud of her. Um, and what's funny is she also has a voice that came from, we have a dog, a pug, and her name is Pi Pi. And she tilts her head and goes, what? Oh, that's not right. Um, that's one of the oldest voices I have. And I had to make a puppet for that voice. Bad news, that voice is not sustainable. So she comes out very rarely. Um, I do use her with the animal rescue. Occasionally we make videos. And actually, she got to interview the district attorney of San Bernardino County in California. Back to the slide at hand. The role of puppets in the classroom, it's so wide. Anytime you have a student, you would want them to explain something, 
you could easily turn it into a type of puppet show. Uh, you could, whether it was an actual puppet show, I mean, I built a green screen theater out of PVC um, and can use that to put a student puppet show there at any time. And they could be in the middle of anything. I haven't used it yet, but I am really looking forward to it um, because I haven't done much with puppets in the classroom yet here at this school in the students' hands. Um, and largely that's been because we haven't gotten to that point in the year. The fifth graders will probably be using puppets near the end of the year when we're doing video uh, because I want them to create videos that are easy to share online that don't um, violate the school's privacy agreement. So keeping the kids' images out of the video and putting puppets in instead makes the work that we do a lot more shareable. Um, so my high school students created puppets and then acted out scenes from Shakespeare's with them. Cheryl Morris uh, is currently working with a group of students to make puppets and then create newscasts for their school with them. I think that the older the students are, you want to give them more and more choice about what it is they're doing with these puppets, how they're applying it. Because it is a bit of a risk to get into using puppets, but if you can get kids to do it, it can also be really powerful and allow them access to parts of themselves they didn't really know existed. It's a great creative outlet. It also requires organization. There's a lot of project-based learning opportunities. Uh, with younger kids, even having them role play situations with puppets or, uh, you know, doing it's like communication workshop sketches. Something comes up, two, two puppets are working on the same iPad and they both have a great idea at the same time. How do they work that out? Um, man, I almost had to have that intervention yesterday. Uh, with video, if putting puppets on video is considerably more safe than putting children faces on video. So even if kids are um, you know, you have to check with your school and district to make sure that you're always inside of their media guidelines, right? Um, because getting called on the carpet for distributing media that's outside of your school's media guidelines can shut you down as a tech integrating teacher for years. You have to actually move schools. Um, and it will not matter that their media guidelines were wrong. Suddenly the voice of experience comes in, right? Um, but Puppets are a great way to make your video more shareable and students are going to be more willing to take risks and create video and put their puppet on screen more and a, a funny voice or a made up voice more than themselves or their own voice. That's kind of a step away from the risk of the ego there. Ah, yes. So. Building your own puppet is really awesome and an amazing experience. It does take some time. There are many, many videos online about building puppets. Um, when you, I'm going to turn on the webcam now, um, but I'll try to make sure that I'm dictating most of what I'm showing for the audience that doesn't have the video. Um, there are a few puppets I own that I did not build, and there's kind of an economics of it at one point. Like this, I did not build. This is a llama by Folk Manus, and I think it was $18, and I actually have a few llamas, and llamas are really, really cool, but I haven't figured out how to make this puppet yet, and I know when I do, it's going to cost me more than $18 to build it. So sometimes you don't want to build your own puppet. But if you're, it's really awesome to build your own puppet. And although it may sound discouraging, I would recommend building six. Now you say, why six? Okay, it doesn't have to be six. But you need to build enough that you kind of work through the process once or twice. You're forgiving with yourself and your learning process 
And, it, you know, there's a lot of people out there building puppets. Some of them are selling their information. Some of them are giving their information for free. Um, there are many videos out there. Some of them are very concise and edited very well. Others are very, very long and unedited, but contain amazing information. So it's something that I love to do, and I knew how to sew to start with. If you know how to sew and you have a sewing machine, great. If you're comfortable with a glue gun, it's even better. So this is Dewey. Hello. And he is adorable. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Where's my body? It's still in the bag. Oh, that's dark. Um, so he is made of foam, and you can kind of see his head. And this is really spongy, like much too thick. The foam I use is half this thick, but I didn't know. He was the first puppet. Um, I had also built his mouth out of uh, cardstock, basically, and this is now cardboard. I actually had to rip out the first mouth. I don't like what he talk about this. And put in a new mouth, and it works just fine. Um, so he was the first puppet I built, and you can see that I built a head, and then I tried to figure out how to build the body. And I'm still, at this point, I'm more comfortable with head, building heads than bodies. Dewey does have arms, unlike Waka. But I don't do much rod puppeting yet. It's a skill I might pick up. Maybe. But I typically need my other hand for, like, twittering or controlling an iPad while it's on screen. So most of my puppets just talk. We get the job done, all right? Right. Um, so there are two basic types of puppets I've built. The foam-type puppet, like Dewey, and the fluff type puppet like Waka. Now Waka is two pieces of fabric that are shaped roughly like this that are sewn together. And then he has a mouth. When you're building a puppet, what you'll notice from the videos you watch is that at least the ones that I've made, I talk a lot about how the mouth is really the key to the puppet because that's where all of your control is. Waka's mouth is built out of plastic from either an ice cream container or an iced tea jug. Um, laundry detergent bottle would work too. Just any, anywhere that you can get a large, two large pieces of plastic. There's like a half circle here and a half circle here. Um, I use cardboard for some of them, but the plastic is nice because it makes his mouth flexible. I hate what you do, Bill. And um, sorry, Waka. On the top and the bottom of the puppet's mouth, there are little control levers that allow you to either move the head up or the mouth down. And when you're puppeting, one of the first tips that you notice in any of the videos, including Jim Henson's, is they really recommend working out your thumb and getting to the point where you're usually just moving the mouth down. Stop now. Sorry. I can show them just by talking. So, you know, that's really important because in real life we don't talk like this, although occasionally I can do that with the puppet. You don't want them to look too flappy. Um, so, yeah, I'm a big advocate of building your own puppet because, A, it frees you from most copyright concerns. Uh, if that were to ever come up, B, you just end up more involved in the puppet and you have more choices. And if you get the kids involved in building puppets, you can end up with a whole, quite literally, puppet army. I mean, if you have a class of 40 kids, it's not hard to end up with 25 puppets. This was Julius Caesar. I don't really feel like talking with him because I don't really know what his voice is, right? But he has a ping pong ball as a nose. And his arms got kind of put really close to you. He doesn't have much of a neck at all. So, hey, that's, that's the truth. 
So head to Brute. You know, that was Julius Caesar. And actually the eye puppet Sammy uh was Mark Anthony from that. That's where I Puppet Sammy came from. And Brutus is right here. And he also has kind of a ping pong ball nose. And you can see on this pattern, uh, th this is part of the batch that the kids are making. And their pattern got a little out of control, and the head ends up being really kind of wide. Um, it's almost like there's two puppet heads in there. So some of my puppets have this kind of elongated head that comes from uh, the kids drew the pattern they used, then they worked from that. They learned to draw that they actually what they did to draw the pattern was in the middle of one of those videos about how to build a puppet, they sh they sh broadcast the drawing onto the board, put a piece of paper onto the board, and created the pattern from that. There was some distortion in the original filming. Yeah. Um, but it was awesome because there were kids that brought in their sewing machines. There were kids that were more engaged in English class during that part than any before. Um, so there are lots of resources out there for building your own puppet. There's a great Jim Henson book, uh, Jim and Cheryl, or I think it's actually a Cheryl Henson book who was published after he died about creating puppets. There's all kinds of books out there about making sock puppets. There's many, many different ways that you can make a puppet. And I advocate doing it. I advocate finding the highest quality version that you can make. I also advocate finding the quickest, easiest version your kids can make. And, you know, find a find a spot between the two. Um, this is some of the best of my contacts information. Um, you can find me in all of those places. And I'm excited to uh, kind of get to the question and answer session. I think is that the next slide here? Yes, it is. Yes, if you have any questions for Sam, please either type them in the chat or raise your hand for the mic privilege. I did capture a few questions as we went by. So let's start with with an early one, and this was before you got on webcam to demonstrate, Sam. Uh, does Sam do ventriloquism was one of the questions. Right, and that's almost always one of the first things the kids say is, like, they're like, your, your lips were moving. I said, of course they were. Um, no, I do, I do shameless, not ventriloquism. Mm -hmm. I okay. puppet side by side with the puppets. I don't do ventriloquism. And then kids ask, why don't you do ventriloquism? I said, and it was funny because I was actually teaching in Las Vegas this summer. So when they asked me why I didn't do ventriloquism, I would reply with something like, if I had those kind of skills, I'd be performing on the strip. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's, it's not something I feel the need to do at all. And basically that's because once you start interacting with the puppet, their eyes go to the puppet when the puppet starts talking. Even the teachers, right. it's amazing. Right. Uh, a question came up shortly thereafter. Do you change personality when you use the puppets, especially the voice? Oh, definitely. The All of the puppets have different personalities. And um, I really try to be as true as I can to those. And the only times I'm successful in puppeting is if I've developed the puppet's personality enough that I can interact with it in a way that isn't just totally bogus. Like there's, um, but there's also, it's funny because there are some personalities that are developed and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't like that puppet very much. Mm -hmm. I need to <laughs> change something about him. But, um, and that's also kind of the origin of Walker was I needed a puppet with a consistently awesome and pro positive personality. So I had to like, mm -hmm. construct him that way from the start. Uh, it, it, it is hard to stay in character with the voice and the kids laugh at me when I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, Someone asks, is it more engaging for kids to start with puppets that you purchase, that is professional puppets, or puppets that they make themselves? I think it's going to be uh, to have them starting with puppets they make themselves, even if it's, you know, just paper bag or sock style puppets, um, mm -hmm. because you get them involved in that act of creation and design. And if you start with a purpose and you're making puppets towards that purpose, um, that, that can be really awesome. 
and another question that just came in, do you use the green screen a lot for making videos? And if you do, what program do you use? I use the green screen as often as I can get away with it. <laughs> um, I use, and I try to use a wide variety of programs because every day it seems there are more coming out that will do it. Um, I, I'm on a PC, so that makes some of my decisions for me. Mm -hmm. I have used Adobe Premiere Elements, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think we only have 10. We don't have 11 here yet. Um, I use Camtasia pretty often. They're really awesome for green screen. does a really good capture. Um, if I'm broadcasting live, I might use the Ustream Producer program. It works really well for that and allows me to export live green screen. And if I'm on my tablet, I'll use TouchCast, although I understand that there's a couple new green screen apps that have come out, and I'm still looking for a really good green screen kind of on the fly or even post-production app for the, the tablet because it's just not quite as powerful. So there is an iPad app or more? The, the TouchCast iPad app um, records in green screen and does a lot of really interesting stuff that can be very helpful delivering, delivering asynchronous instruction via an iPad, but mm -hmm. it's difficult to export that movie into another environment. Um, so TouchCast makes a really good product, but you can't simply save your green screen movie to the camera roll, which makes mm -hmm. it difficult to get it to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. still looking for a better version there. Does anyone else in the room have a question for Sam? Those were the questions that I gathered through during the show. I, I did see you mention the, the Puppet iPad apps, and it's interesting because, you, as you can imagine, I get iPad apps tweeted at me sometimes about puppets by a lot of different people. And um, I've noticed they kind of fall into two categories where one is like there's one called Puppet Workshop where you can design any kind of a puppet, but then you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's apps like Puppet Pals. And Puppet Pals is really interesting because you can essentially create little puppet movies. And I haven't, I've used those with, I used Puppet Pals this past week with the first grade. Uh, we were using the director's edition and we took drawings that they had made and we imported them into the app as puppets and then they had the drawings they were coral reef animals talk about what they had you know what their environment was and how they worked and that kind of thing so you know i've used those for um as far as an ipad app i was just remembering about uh store-bought versus made puppets and one of one nice point of kind of compromise this is a uh, Muppet Whatnot, and I think they're more expensive now, but Hasbro put these little ones out a couple years ago. And what's really nice is they have all of these Velcro pieces, <laughs> and it allows you to kind of custom design your, uh, your puppet. So if you want kids to do some work with puppets and feel ownership in it but don't have time to go through the whole process, you could, you know, have them create a puppet fairly quickly. And I've got two of them. One of them is purple and one of them is green. And what's nice is this one is blue screen friendly and this one is green screen friendly. So if I ever need to use them that way, I can. But you know, you can see that these are actually designed for children because my hand hardly fits into the back of the back of their heads at all. I have that same problem with this puppet. Isn't it beautiful? It's a great frog. And that definitely goes in my bag of puppets for kids to use. Because that's what I like. You know, if I'm going to have kids use puppets, I like to show up with a bunch of puppets I can arm them with. Because I'm showing up with puppets for me to use. And they all want to hug and love and interact with and play with my puppets. But they're really not that durable. Um, and so in order to make it like, no, you can't have my puppets. I, you know, make sure I've got puppets I can hand off to the kids. There's a number of teachers out there who've been making a lot of paper puppets with kids, some paper bag style, but even some more complicated. I want to look into that. Uh, 
I haven't seen any. Oh, here's here's another question. Do you set up rules about using puppets with the kids? Um, more than rules, it's kind of expectations. Mm -hmm. um, where what's really nice is we use the responsive classroom system in our school, where it's you know they have essentially I think it's three three guidelines, taking care of yourself, taking care of others, taking care of the environment. So we talk about, you know, how do you take care of the puppets and how do you play respectfully with them. Um, it helps them also the iPad guy. So we've had these conversations about the iPads also. Um, so we've got that kind of common language. But it is really important to set those expectations. Yeah, Doug's saying origami puppets. I've seen um, some of the teachers here will do just popsicle stick and paper puppets, and that's great. And with the iPads now, we can set up an environment to film those and do a green screen import. Because um, what's really neat is once the kids make the puppet, if you put that puppet in front of a green piece of paper, you can put that puppet anywhere. So if the kids are learning about the coral reef, you can put some coral reef pictures in the background, and suddenly they're in the environment. And they just love how that looks. When you have students make puppets from scratch, how long does it take for them to complete a puppet? Usually that question of how long do we have for them to complete the puppet mm -hmm. will determine what I look for, what I try for in puppet design, right? Like, you know, there's, there's puppets like Pi Pi here, right? And we're getting, getting kind of close on Pi Pi and you can see that she's actually got a good deal of detail. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, uh, I don't know, she's probably 30, 40 hours worth of my work, right? Um, so with the kids, we don't have that kind of time. So some of the videos I've watched, you know, the puppets are as simple as, you know, a pair with two eyes on it on a stick. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can make puppets. And I think it's important to make the creation process interesting enough that they're engaged, but not too frustrating, so that they're still bringing a lot of energy into whatever creation project you're doing. Or you set aside one class period specifically for creating the puppets, and another for doing something with them. Thank you. Those are the questions that I have seen and captured. Um, do we have any others for Sam? I think there are people in the room that have worked with puppets. Does anyone want to take the mic? Raise your hand and you can take the mic. Bueller, Bueller. Oh, the giver, that would be interesting. Hmm. What's nice, what I noticed when they were doing Shakespeare is when I asked the students to have two puppets interact, enact a scene out of the Julius Caesar, they spent more time actually reading and analyzing the scene because they had to figure out exactly what the puppets were going to do, what they would say, what their emotion was, and then they spent more time reading the lines out loud because they actually had to practice. Ooh, puppetry and reader response, I like that. Can you speak any more about the permissions you obtain for sharing this type of student work? Uh, you bet. I try, I talk, I work a lot with, directly with my school administration so they know what I'm sharing uh, because I want them to hear it from me first that we're doing this awesome stuff and I'm sharing it in this worldwide community of teachers and it's really exciting um, because I think that framework is important. Um, and then, like my school, we've got set up guidelines with what can and can't appear in public information connected to our school. So I make sure I go by those. Um, we also have a form that is a, a permissions for photography, et cetera. Um, but you know, as much as possible, I, t I try to keep the students directly out of it. Their voices and their puppets is great. and 
most parents want that, like they're very comfortable with the voices and puppet stuff being public because the kids' names aren't necessarily on it anywhere, but they want it to be accessible somewhere public so they can share it. Yeah, you got to think a lot about the rules because the last thing you want to do is come up with these really great ideas and share them and have the principal walk in and go, no. That was what I like to play the principal. You never work for principals that are like that, though. They're usually pretty nice and understanding. Oh, you bet, Nancy. I think having the the puppets read a poem is so much easier because uh, writing an authorship is such a horrible act of vulner ego vulnerability that having the puppets read it instead, the puppets can make a mistake. I make mistakes all the time. It's like half of my job. And then the other half of my job is being funny. And the other half of my job, there's only two halves. Not my job. It's got at least three halves, I swear. Um, so, you know, having the kids read their, having the puppet read the poetry instead, I think could be great. You could definitely try it out. You could, like, have them make little beatnik poem, poetry uh, puppets. And actually, I think if you search beatnik Muppet, they did an ongoing series of, like, letter A educational video kind of things uh, using beatnik poetry reading puppets on Sesame Street at some point. Singing is huge, Doug. I don't sing well enough, but um, this summer I was at Q Rockstar uh, USS Hornet where we were doing a professional development on a aircraft carrier and I brought the puppets with me and Tracy Walker, uh, elementary teacher here in California, we did, recorded the preposition song using one of the puppets. It was amazing. I love seeing the puppets sing. Thank you all okay. for being here. This was exciting. Thanks a lot, Sam. I think I'm going to do some of the, the wrap-up slides now. I'm turning the mic over to Peggy for this slide. Thank you so much, Sam. This was just great. And we have lots of videos and things that we can explore after the show, too. So thank you. Um, this slide is making a plea to all of you. I know so many of you are regular participants, and there are some who aren't with us today, too. But we're looking to expand what we're doing with the show. And I would love to find several people who are enthusiastic, connected educators who are familiar with our show to form an advisory team and to help provide us with some um, recommendations for uh, potential presenters and um, ideas for topics for our shows. And we also have a lot of other behind the scenes things that go on to get ready for the shows. We prepare Google Docs and slides and send out confirmation emails to the presenters and lots of things like that. So things before the show and after the show, publishing, et cetera, creating the image for the home page. Um, and then we can always use backup moderators in Blackboard Collaborate in case one of us can't be here. So if you are interested in doing that, I would love to have you either send me an email or you can type it right in one of the comment boxes on the survey with your email and I'll set up a meeting sometime in the next week or two and invite all of you to join me here in the Blackboard Collaborate room and we'll talk about I'll answer any questions you have and talk about how that might work. And you could volunteer for just a single task. It doesn't have to be a whole bunch of things. If that's something you would be interested in and can fit it in your schedule, I would love to have you. And I'll type my email address again in the, in the chat box. Thanks. 
Thank you, Peggy. The connected classroom scheduling is um, taking a break um, during Connected Educator Month. That that's uh, the future of education with Steve Hargadon. That's taking a break, but the it looks like the. Connected Educator Cafe conversations were at 7.30 Eastern Time. There are recordings available. There's a link here for recordings. Upcoming shows for Classroom 2.0 Live. Uh, next Saturday, November 9th, Shelley Terrell is going to be here about YouTube video, video editing tools. November 16th, the November featured teacher is, is me, Lori Moffat. November 23rd is a joint presentation with EduCamp New Jersey and face-to-face -face meets virtual, um, combining Classroom 2.0 with a, an EduCamp, EduCamp session. November 30th, there isn't a show because that is Thanksgiving weekend in the United States. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the link, or the form at the link at tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate, but no E at the end. And um, that's how you can nominate a featured teacher for the monthly featured teacher show. And when you exit the room, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open. And the link for the survey is on this slide as well. Um, the link should be in the chat box soon. There we go. And you can open it from the chat box, or you can open it will automatically open when you exit Blackboard Collaborate. It's also in the live binder, uh, so you can request a PD certificate from the survey. And when you do that, which is here on the next slide. Please make sure the email address is a personal email address instead of a school email address because sometimes these emails are blocked from school addresses. The recordings for today's show are in two iTunes U channels. One is a video collection, the other is an audio collection. And those links are also in the Classroom 2.0 page. So you can either watch the videos on a mobile device or listen to the audio collection with a, an Apple-related mobile device. There's also an RSS feed of show archives that you can subscribe to. This is on the Classroom 2.0 website. And I'd like to uh, offer special thanks to our special guests, Sam P Patterson and Waka and and friends, because we heard many puppets today. And thank you, Park thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Waka. And Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project, Weebly.com for providing our website, and everyone who participated in this show, as well as uh, Black or collaborate for providing the classroom. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>